third boat. Yeah. I imagine the water's still pretty cool. Uh, yeah. Even on a hot day, you know. Yep. If they were drinking, you know, it's it's not a good not a good thing. Nope. So just so you folks know, um, Melanie is running a little late. So I think Rick is prepared to start the meeting and run the meeting for us. And uh, I know Dan was participating in the legislature tonight, so I'm not sure exactly what his availability is. Has anyone? I have not heard from him. He, okay. he told me today, but I haven't heard from him. He might be late. But. I know that they're down to the to the nitty gritty here, so they got one week left to get their stuff done. Well, three is a quorum, so Rick, we can just plod right ahead. Yeah, we've got uh, one more minute before it's officially 6.30. Yep, I got it on my computer. And just so everyone knows, at 8 o'clock, I'm going to step away. I'm in the town office tonight, and I'm going to shut down the drop box uh, for ballots and empty out any ballots that we may have in there. So I'm going to go dark just for a minute or two, and you guys just keep on doing your thing. We may be done by then if I hurry. <laughs> <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> if you can accomplish that, Rick, you can run the meetings all the time, Rick. If you think there you go. <laughs> all right, well, now it is. Well, by my clock, it is 6.30. I'd like to open the select board meeting on, what's the date today? 6-8-2021. Um, I'm going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Barbara to lead us tonight if she'd like to. Would you I'd like to? Happy, I'd be happy to. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd entertain a motion to open the meeting. I'll make that motion. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor? We've got Dan and Melanie on here yet, but it, I believe they'll be coming in. Um, I guess the next thing we got to do is approve the minutes from the last select board meeting. So I'd take a motion to open that. So moved. Second. They moved and seconded. Any discussion on it? It looked okay to me. I didn't see anything. Ernie, you all set with it? Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Seeing none, I didn't attain a vote. I set off with Barbara? Yes. Ernie? Yes. Myself, yes. So three and two absent. I have to keep looking at the agenda. <laughs> uh, We're almost done. Oh, geez. You know, <laughs> I, I jumped ahead a little bit. I'm sorry. I was supposed to do public comment, and I didn't yes. do that, but I'll open it up to public comment. If anybody's got anything they'd like to bring up now, we'll listen to it. We're not going to discuss it much. We'll just listen to what you got to say. Go from there. Do we have anybody has got anything? Good. We'll move right on to the next thing. We're going to go right into new business. Um, we've got a couple of board appointments. Um, the first one is Tom Bennett, and I think that's a reappointment, Mike. Yes, it is. So yes. I can a motion on that. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. In. Any discussion on it? I'm going to turn yeah. you down. Seeing none. Uh, Barbara, what's your pleasure? Yes. Ernie? Yes. Myself, yes. Thank you. We'll move on to the next one. Phil Sprague. Um, make a, take a note. Yeah, I'll, I'll, so moved. Yep. Second. Thank you. That's a reappointment also. Yes. So if that's the way you'd like to do it, I'd, Take a motion to accept that. Absolutely. Barbara? Yes. Thank and thank them, thank them both for serving. Absolutely. So, seeing no more discussion on this, we're going to vote on it. Barbara? Yes. 
Ernie? Ernie? Yes. Ms. Hope, yes. So three and two were absent. Being on here, discussion of recreation. Custodian and the council, camp council. Is that right, Anthony? You want to take it from here? Sure. Um, we are in the process of hiring for both of those positions, custodian and camp counselor. And so the recreation director, Lily Schubert, and I thought this would be an opportune time just to look at the uh, job descriptions and update those. And there's not any significant changes uh, to either one, particularly with the counselor. There were some redundancies in there that we tried uh, to eliminate. And um, so with that being said, I mean, we provided these to you last week. And if you have any questions, Lily and I will be happy to entertain those. I have a couple of questions. Yep, go ahead. Um, in the job description for the custodian, um, it says in the first sentence, uh, custodial and maintenance, maintenance work primarily in the parks and recreations facilities. But then it goes on to talk about how one day a week the person would be cleaning the town office. So I'm not sure how many hours that takes out of the 25, but should that be mentioned more upfront if that's going to be a regular part of the job? Yeah, and so, and let me explain just a little bit of history of that, Barbara. At one okay. time, the town did uh, hire a cleaning service at a cost of about three thousand uh, dollars to clean the town office twice a week, and we moved to having that done by uh, a member of our um, um, transfer station staff and also someone from our facilities maintenance, and so. Since it is custodial work, we decided that uh, this would be a good opportunity to make use of the recreation custodian. It shouldn't take more than a couple of hours out of that person's uh, work week. Uh, and so, um, you know, if you want to move that up a little higher in the description, I, that causes me no heartburn whatsoever. Okay, I mean, it just seems like it's, it's uh, presented under other duties as requested. Um, other duties as it's signed, including cleaning the town office once a week. I don't know, that just seemed like it's a fairly, you know, it's not a, it's not a, oh, by the way, it's, this is a big, you know, this is a significant yeah. part of the job or. Well, I tell you what, we could easily move that cleaning the town office once a week into that second paragraph under nature of work. Or essential duties. I mean, if that's what. Yeah, well, okay. and I was just, so, so where it says the employer's responsible oh, I see. for the yeah. general cleaning and minor maintenance of the center for all seasons, and we could say the North Belgrade Center and a, a weekly cleaning of the town office. Okay, yeah, okay, that would be good, thank you. Is a week, a one day a week enough, even in the winter, Anthony? Uh, yeah, so what we've done, Rick, is just have someone clean it on Mondays and someone clean it on Thursdays, uh, and so... Uh, that's worked out pretty well for us. And, and, and fortunately, our staff is such that if, if there is a mess during the winter time that needs to be cleaned up, you know, someone tracks in some snow or some mud or something, um, one of us here in the town office doesn't mind jumping in and, and cleaning that up. Lily, has your um, recreation members looked this over? Are they happy with it? Uh, they have not had a chance yet. We've been struggling to get a meeting together for the last month. Yeah, we haven't had quorums the last couple of the last couple of meetings, and so we didn't want to delay on this since uh, since we're in the, the hiring process. We thought it'd be good to hire someone on, with the new job descriptions. I have another one or two things. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah. Um, I like that um, under the counselor job description, there's a sentence about um, ability to work independently with minimal supervision. And um, here it says for the, um, the custodian ability to work relatively independently without supervision. But I think, I think that that relatively independently without supervision is a little muddy to me. Okay, so requirements, um, of, requirements of work of the um, of the uh, custodian. custodian. But when I saw that, that just struck me as being a little 
I don't know, relatively independently without supervision. But I think I think the same sentiment is expressed in the counselor's job description, ability to work independently with minimal supervision. That seems to me to say the same thing, but a little more clean. Okay. Got it. And then under training and experience in the third or fourth sentence, knowledge in the use and storage of swimming pool chemicals is preferred or is willing to learn, I would suggest changing that to willingness to learn. Okay. But I think, you know, I think it looks great. I think it's, it does a really good mm -hmm. job of explaining what's needed. Ernie, do you have anything? No, not really. I, I like it. it uh, it's good to make these changes and they, they were thorough and articulate. So I would go with that. You want to adopt them or what do you want to do? Yes, we would like select board approval of, of the um, of the job descriptions with the changes uh, suggested by council or excuse me, select board member Allen. Is this something that has to be tonight? I, I just like to have the whole board when we oh. say this. No, it, no, it does not have to be tonight. And because we missed last week's meeting, we're gonna be meeting a week from tonight anyway. So if you wanna hold it till then, that, that'd be fine. I think on my personal feelings, I like to have the whole board when we make changes to any policy or any. That's fine. Description, whatever. This will be old business next week. That's right. Okay. In fact, we may be able to do it tonight if the other two get here. They may. Melanie will for sure. I'm not sure about Dan. Yeah. Is that fine with everybody else? All right, so I just, we're just, it's just a discussion, so we don't. Sorry, that was Zoom. Okay, <laughs> well, I just come on my computer, boom. <laughs> um, we don't have to take a vote on this, we can, because it's just a discussion right at the present time, correct? It's, is it a timeliness issue, Anthony, in terms of being able to have a job description if you're interviewing people? I think if uh, I think if we approve them these next Tuesday, that would that would suit our purposes. Okay. Great. Oh, so I recommend we just put this on for old business next week. Okay, and I'll make those changes that Barbara suggested. Okay. Thank you. Um, next thing up is <clears throat> discussion on the local property value trends. I see bogs here tonight. Yeah, Rob is here tonight, our, our assessor, and uh, just to sort of set the stage for him, we recently discovered that because of the formulas, which Rob will explain that uh, relate to assessing, our uh, homestead exemption is uh, dropping from $25,000 to $23,000. So I wanted him to explain that to you, and it may also um, be the first discussion uh, towards whether or not the town is in need of a uh, reassessment of its property values. So with that having uh, been said, Rob, you want to take it over? Sure. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Thank you. Hey. So um, like Anthony said, yes, the um, every year we get a report from the state to tell us what our assessments are in relationship to the most recent sale prices in Belgrade. And when the state runs that ratio, they tell, us, they tell us what the maximum amount of homestead that we can give to every, every Belgrade resident. So because the market has been so flat up until lately, we've been able to give the full $25,000 $25, homestead because we're able to declare to the state that our assessments are close enough to current market to be able to certify 100% of market value. And you know, we all know how crazy the market has been lately. So the latest report we come into the state from the state tells us that we can only assess our, our historical assessments that date back to the last time a revaluation was done 
we can only declare that our assessments are at 92% of the most recent sale prices in Belgrade. And when I say most recent, I'm not talking about the sales that have occurred this spring. I'm talking about the most recent that were on that ratio study provided from the state. So with the state's concern for 2021, they look at sales that occurred in late 2018 and early 2019. But just really before things have been influenced by COVID, but the market had started to appreciate at that point. And our revaluation that was done in 2012, we've used those same sets of numbers all these years. So now it's to a point where the market has finally started to increase and we haven't changed our assessments. So we are not able to give the full 25% homestead. And it's in all the towns that I work in, it's prevalent because the market is strong everywhere we work. So I think it's a good idea that the board understands what this means and what people will see in their tax bill in case they're approached on the street, that they can give them a good answer. You can give them a good answer. Are you saying basically that maybe it's time to re do reevaluation again? We need to start thinking about that, yes. I thought you remember about that. I didn't think it changed till we got down to the 90%. Well, see, the way the homestead works is they look at a sales study based on just developed parcels in Belgrade, in every town in Belgrade. So the waterfront is not included in this ratio. If there's any commercial property sales, that's not included. And what happens is they tell us what our actual ratio is. And we're allowed to declare a number 10% above that. So we can always give 100% homestead when our assessments are 91% or above this most recent sales study. And right now our ratio is at 84%. You add 10% to that, that brings us to the 92. So we are, Rick, are, we are dropping below that 90% that 90 number. At 84, we're halfway between the maximum that we want to shoot for of 100 and the minimum that we have to be at, at 70. So not really knowing what the market is going to do, it wouldn't be surprising at all if we get close to that 70% level in a couple, three years. So, uh, you know, Anthony and I wanted to sit down and talk to the board tonight about letting them know where the ratio is at and that we ought to consider a plan for changing our values in the next few years. The other uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, Rick, go ahead. Oh, that's all right, go ahead. You. Um, so Rob, given the fact that the market has really exploded here in the last year, year and a half, is this problem likely to be exacerbated by that? It would be. And then the time lag that we're talking about also. So like I said, for 2021, we're looking at second half of 2019, first half of 2020 sales. And if you, if you look at the COVID influence on this local market, you didn't see that COVID influence only but the the tail end of the first half of 2020. So next year's certified ratio, I expect to be even lower than this, just on the trends that I've seen. And there's really no slowing down yet. So two years from now, we're gonna be in even a more significant situation. I won't say worse, because we will always give the taxpayer the maximum amount of homestead that we can based on the parameters that we live with, with the state of Maine. So like I said, right now we're at 84%. The maximum we can give it to taxpayers is 92% of the 25,000, which is what we're doing to get to the, the $23,000 level. So we'll do the maximum, but it's gonna to come to a point where it's gonna be a significant spread between the, the sale prices and the level that we can assess, so. Yes, yeah. what happens if, if the, uh economy falls apart, which it may. It, it may, it may. And it's just, it's good to, um, it's good to kind of not make some sort of hasty decision. But the thing is with the computerized records that we started to get at the last Revo, we're not quite all the way there yet. Um, we can easily change our assessments. 
especially in a downward manner. If the market started to take a, a turn downward and we could see that all of our assessments are trending a little higher than what they should be, we can relax all the assessments by a constant number very easily, even with the assessments, the, the, the software that we have now. Um, one of the things that I propose when we do this reval is we complete the computerization process of our records, meaning that not only is the, are the valuations done by TRIO, the photograph is in TRIO, the sketch is in TRIO, so our entire record is computerized and we can zip off to a taxpayer or to a realtor the entire, the entire record very easily. Plus, it makes it even more easily to change values downward where if things do change the way they might. But right now, we're still in an upward market. Next year's state valuation is gonna be even further away from market than we are now, just because of the time lag. And I'll be able to give you a better answer two years from now, what, a year from now, what the two year projection is looking like. Thank you. Jack had his hand up. Jack, do you have something? You're, you're muted. Jack, you're muted still. Just, just a question. Uh, does this have any impact at all on the on the uh, valuation that's used for the apportionment of the school district costs? No, sir. No, sir. Every year, every town in the state of Maine is at a different level, the different assessment ratio. So the state always equalizes. So basically, here in Belgrade, if we're at 92%, they're going to take their parameter, their, their information that they use and bring our 92% number up to 100, where in Sydney, for example, where they do a reval, they may be more towards the 70% number. They're going to bring that from their local assessments from 70 up to 100. So the state does their process every year to put every town at a full 100%, if you will, based on the parameters that they work at. So what we do locally has no effect on that at all. But what it does affect is, like I said, we're giving 23,000 instead of 25,000. Some people make, may make note of that, but it's typical of what we're seeing across Maine. Our maximum assessing is 110. When we get to the minimum of assessing of, of 70%, if we get below that number, the state will start withholding reimbursement to the town. And that's when it's fiscally irresponsible for us not to change assessments upward, but we're very, very far away from that now, but we wanted to start the conversation with the board to let them realize that we need to start long-term planning is all. And I don't want this to, this news to uh, overly alarm anyone about what the impact on the taxpayer is going to be, because as those property values rise and, and the exemption comes down, it may actually give us the opportunity to reduce the mill rate somewhat just to raise the same amount of money that we did say for instance this year. So, um, so oh, and here Dan and Melanie are just joining us now too. So, so anyway, so it may actually give us an opportunity to lower the mill rate somewhat so that it won't have a, um, an, a financial impact on the average taxpayer. And, and please correct me if I've said anything wrong there, Rob. Oh, you're, no, you're correct, you're correct. It'll, it'll ponder the question for people because it's been years and years and years since we've had to certify something different than 100. But all things considered, I think most people are pleasantly, are, are pleased to be in a, an upward market as opposed to a flat market or even a downward market. We will field those phone calls. The clerks out front, I will, I'll have a conversation with them to make sure they're comfortable with, with explaining that same thing to the taxpayers if, if they feel that they're comfortable doing that. If not, they can they can send those messages into me. But like I said, every town that I work in is starting to see this slipping because the market is very strong throughout, throughout Maine. And so Rob, how long is the process of a reassessment? It would take one cycle. It would take one tax book from between one commitment and another. And there's many different ways of doing this, um, but it's always a year process. By the time we took out whatever we're going to do for field visits, sales analysis, updating records, checking records, having taxpayer hearings in it before the commitment's done, it's always a year process. 
and as you and I discussed, you also think this could be an opportunity for us to go fully digital on our on our tax records, correct? Correct. This is the perfect time to final finalize those steps that were started back in 2012. Yeah. And just so the board knows, one of the potential advantages of that is simply that it would be much more accessible to our taxpayers. So we get lots of phone calls here in the town office, uh, typically from real estate agents, sometimes from, from other types of brokers wanting uh, us to send them tax cards. And those are things that they could uh, go on our website and, uh, and download themselves uh, if, we were, if we were fully digitized. We're a little behind the curve on that. Most towns have become digitized recently. So it's something that no matter what we do for an upgrade in value, we want to want to talk about changing those as well. And Rob, what, what would you estimate the cost of that process to also be? Well, it's kind of a, it's kind of a weird process because as your agent, I'm going to, you know, we would look at if this was to go out to bid like Sydney did last year to do a full revaluation. Um, that means somebody, it, you know, it, it's an open bidding process. And I would say based on the size of this town, for somebody to come in and, and that doesn't know anything about Belgrade at all and start brand new, it would be between... Two hundred and fifty and two hundred and sixty thousand dollars to do that, to do that process. Um, it's just it, like it's a weird position because that wouldn't be what I would put in for a bid because being familiar with Belgrade, working there for thirty plus years, um, there's a, things that I would be able to do to minimize that cost. Some things you can't avoid, but that would be. We do this for a lot of my clients when they're looking to do a reval and a lot of the town charters say you need to put every bid up over a certain amount of money out to bid. Um, I would tell the town to put something in their budget for between 250 and 260,000 a year, put it out to bid, and then I would be able to offer something significantly less than that because of being the agent all these years. At least it's, it gives you a ballpark that you would, you would budget for and then if it ends up being less, all the better. So um, because we've got it right now with our fiscal year being a calendar year, those funds could be raised over two commitments, which would help the, the spike in the, the, the cost of this sort of thing. But these are just, you know, basically wetting the ground at this point with the board to let you know to expect to have these conversations again in the future because things are starting to slip. And again, that, that figure that Rob just quoted, that's something that sort of makes you gasp a little bit, but we're in a very fortunate position to have a uh, incredibly healthy undesignated fund and fund balance. And so that, what we're talking about here with the reassessment, it's a one-time cost. It's something that we only face every 10 to 15 years. And so using that undesignated fund would be a perfect opportunity uh, to, to have this done without having to raise and appropriate additional do uh, tax dollars in order to cover the cost. Exactly. Tony, you want me to turn this over to you? Are you ready? Uh, sure. What, what I, well, let me just give you a little history of what we did. We did, we talked about the um, custodian and the counselor. Um, we decided to wait on that, to make a recommendation until everybody was here. So we could go back to that if you'd like, but it was going to be on next week's agenda. So whatever you'd like to do on that. Um, we've got everybody here. We could, we could deal with that tonight. If you want. Okay. And then we just moved on to value the property values. That's, that's where we are now. Everything else above that's. Now, Rob, can I ask a question on property value doing a reassessment? That then would alter Belgrade's portion for like the schools. No, it that wouldn't. Would it would not, because like I was explaining to John, that the state every year comes in and they equalize everybody's value. Their, their method, their formula is a little bit more cursory than ours, but they make an attempt to equalize every town's value every year. So in theory, in theory the state has their 100% valuation on every town. 
And it started by our ratio adjusted up or down based on the most recent market. So they don't, so there's nothing we can do locally at our assessments to change that formula, Melody. But the idea is we have a minimum assessing standard that we are supposed to maintain at 70%. And our latest ratio is at 84. So we're halfway to a failing standard. It's tethered a little bit by increasing it to the homestead amount that we can give, but we are halfway to the failing standard. And, you know, we just, Anthony and I just thought it would be a good idea to bring it up to the board now to start the thought process of maybe planning, basically. But as far as the state goes, there's nothing we can do locally to change that number. But what that then does is that changes people's property tax. It will change everybody's local valuation. And of course, the budget's are always set. So it could be a swing uh, one way or the other. And the latest thing, the surprising thing is the market is really strong for, I've always had the conversation with this board about how market value on the, on the water inflates much faster than off the water. Well, the market here is totally different. That 84% number works for within a percent or two for on water and off water which is very unusual. The market is very strong everywhere we go. So just those basic numbers, there wouldn't be a big change in tax burden between non-waterfront and waterfront like we've seen in the past because of the, the way the market has been lately. Okay, because I think one of the reasons, Rob, why we always kind of hold off, and I, I feel deja vu here, um, I think the last time we did it, we were literally on the cusp of being on the failing end of that and the reason is because there are a lot of elderly folks in Belgrade and we we all know that it's an aging population and their their living standard has not gone up right and what they bring in for income has not and will not increase so I know that's one of the reasons why we have always played that very very close you know, Melanie, yeah. but I, I would argue that as your property values go up, if you're trying to raise the same amount of money, it gives you an opportunity to actually lower your mill rate. So just because your values go up doesn't necessarily mean that your taxation has to go up. It's a, ba it's a balancing act between those two numbers, between what your, evalu what your valuations are and what your mill rate is. And so, um, you know, the, the town's budget this year was pretty much flat. Uh, we saw a slight increase in um, the school budget, at least our apportionment of the school budget, assuming that it passes today. And then a, a, a larger increase in that in the county budget, but it represents only 8% of our total annual budget. And so, you know, I do think that there's probably a, a good opportunity for us to, um, you know, control the mill rate uh, in the coming year as a result of, of all of those factors. And and with the property values continuing to rise, it, it actually may allow us just to lower the mill rate a tad, just to raise the same, same number of dollars. If you think of it this way, if, if everybody, if all property, in a perfect world, let's just say, if all of our properties were at 70% uh, of market value, which is our minimum assessment standard, across the board, no matter what type of property it was, we're all at 70%. And we raised everybody's assessment by 30% to bring it to 100% market value, not accounting for any changes up or down in the budget, your values would go up 30%, your mill rate would go down 30%, and your, your tax burden wouldn't change. The only time you see a change, Melody, would be if one class of property changes significantly more than another class. You know, we've always seen it lately that, you know, the waterfront property, because the market is much stronger in those types, that class of property would go up by 30% and your off water would go up by 20%, you'd change everybody's assessment, but you'd see a burden shift to the waterfront because they've gone up more than the standard. But as of this point, I haven't seen that. It's been consistent across the board, which helps out what you're talking about with somebody who lives it locally and have, has a problem with their, with their financial burden for their property tax bill. Um, but like I said, we're not near that point yet we just wanted to put the bug in your ear now because we were talking about the homestead change that is an inevitable situation with what the market's doing. Um, and, and again, inevitable. Yeah, and again, we were just concerned that when people get their 
their tax statements, they're going to see that their property exemption is only, or their homestead exemption is only $23,000. And they're going to wonder what's going on. So it's something that we're really going to have to inform and, and educate our, our taxpayers about. And so this is the, this is the first step of that, that, that process. So Rob, as you were talking, this just occurred to me, the 70% standard, the state also reimburses the uh, municipality 70% of the homestead exemption. Are those two figures related in any sort of way? Is, no, not at all. Just totally just a, just a coincidence. Okay. Yeah. Because when you get to that 70% level, when you start falling below that 70%, for every 1% that we're lower than 70, the state will withhold 10% of our tree growth reimbursement. And in Belgrade, we have a lot of land in tree growth. I wouldn't be surprised if we get $28,000, $35,000 a year in tree growth reimbursement. As we get below 70, that's when the state will, will start nipping away at those numbers. So that's when, that's when you start to see the the financial hurt from the town. Um, forget the fact that some class of the property could be at a different level. That's when the state can step in and say, we're gonna withhold these tree growth reimbursements. So um, I guess as my agent, my responsibility is to let the town be aware annually where we're at, what I see the trend to be. Being at 92% is totally fine. It's better than a lot of the towns that we're in because the market has seen eight, 10, 12% increases in, in sale prices in a given year. So we're gonna see that reflected. We haven't changed our assessments since 2012. You hold that same assessment level year after year and the market goes up, you're gonna to start to see a disparity between the two of them. And for the first year, we're starting to see that. So we start with this, this conversation um, and see what the market does. And you don't think Rob that we're going to see this bubble that we have now in a couple of years go the other way. It wouldn't surprise me at all. I've, we've nobody, this is unprecedented in this, in this, we've never seen anything like this at all. Right. I mean, 2008, 2009, 2010, we started to see something, a lowering. Um, and we adjusted the assessments as need be. When I took over the reins again in 2016, every sale in Belgrade was just a little bit over what we had to assess for. I mean, I'm sorry, a little bit under what we had assessed for and that market's finally taken, taken back. Um, even the, the limited computerized records that we have, if things change in the next couple of years, if the bubble does burst, we, can, we have the ability to address that. Um, I've, from what I've read, that everything that caused the bubble to burst back in 2006, 7, 8, none of those situations are in play here now, but nothing would surprise me. But remember, for 2021 that we're talking about now, we're look, the state gives us data from sales that happened in 2019 and first half of 2020. So when things start to go awry, if you will, today, we won't see it in our state evaluation for two years. So that'll give us some time to react. And we'll just, as long as we stay up on it, we'll be fine. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hopefully I didn't ask questions somebody else had already asked. Not a bit. Not a bit. <laughs> All right, does anybody else have anything for Rob? Oh, did you have yeah. something for me? Yeah, just simply, uh, you know, I just would like to know sort of what the board's feel is. Is this something you would like for us to explore a little further, the possibility of our undergoing a, a, a reassessment? Uh, and if so, you know, we could start preparing some sort of a, either a request for proposal or request for qualifications uh, if the board thinks that this is something that we ought to be exploring. So I honestly think that until we figure out what our cost is gonna be for the public water system mm -hmm. and some of those things that we don't have any idea what we're gonna be plugging in for numbers. I don't want us to tap into the undesignated fund as our side savings account um, and anticipate, because it feels like we're we're using that a lot that it's relatively healthy and then what's going to happen is then all of a sudden it's not going to be so then then we get into the pickle where then we're raising the mill rate more than that's gradual so that we can come back to this point so i feel like there's we have some unknowns here 
that I feel like we've got to get a handle on and start to see where that's going to go. Maybe if we hold this off for six months and get us through the beginning stages of that, maybe even nine months so that we start to have a feel on where we're going to be, then I think that we can figure out how to budget for this. I don't think there's something that we can ignore. I mean, we do tend to sweep it under the rug a bit. I recall that a couple of times. Um, but I, I would like, while we have a big unknown there to, you know, hang on just a little bit is my thought. Um, if we, if we do put it off, then. Next July. Yeah. Okay. So this is the ball, the long-term thought process going. Okay. So you're like, so when I bring this back up next June, Melanie, you're not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And again, my, my main concern is just, you know, sort of the sticker shock, if you will, of people seeing their homestead exemptions going down and just assuming that their that their taxes as a result are going to be going up. But I think I, I mean I think that you're doing set you and the communications committee are doing such a great job with the with the newsletter that with repeated explanations in there, um, yeah, I think this, that, that would that would help get the word this, out. This does give us an opportunity. So I have one question for Representative Newman. Dan, have you heard anything about the possibility of the reimbursement of homestead exemptions changing in any of the legislation you guys are considering? Uh, there, there was a bill that came before us yesterday, and I don't know where it's going to go. I doubt it's going to go anywhere, but it was to make a $50,000 homestead exemption. So... Oh, really? And then and then to maintain the 70 percent reimbursement that I don't know if it was in there. I, I know it was the the argument from the person who put it forward and I didn't get a chance to completely read the bill was that, you know, people that have 50 or 100 thousand dollar properties or have a piece of property they want to put a tiny home on that are retired because they're losing their property. If they get something that's only valued at fifty thousand dollars, they shouldn't have to pay any taxes on it or close to it. So but I, I doubt very much it'll go anywhere. But that's the only one I know of at the moment. All right, does anybody else have anything? Anybody else wanna weigh in on what your thoughts are? I think I'd like to wait a little bit, see what's gonna happen. I cannot believe this economy is gonna stay the way it is now. Just can't possibly. Um, I mean, look at the building costs. Now, I just can't keep going like this. But that actually adds to the value of the existing home market. The, the value of the existing homes do increase because of nobody can really spend the, the exorbitant amount to build a brand new house. So it keeps those That's values. right now until the market falls apart. And then you've got a million dollar house that's only worth 200000 so that's that's kind of my concern. If I had a crystal ball, I'd be buying property up everywhere to know what's what, but I just don't. I mean, what look what people are selling this stuff for. I mean, why wouldn't they? Uh, uh, my I have my house in Gardner on the market right now, and I'm, once I'm done with here, I'm actually calling my realtor back. I had three full value offers in a week since Tuesday. Yeah. One of them is over, and I have three offers. Two of them are cash, and they're both from out of state. And that's what we're seeing. And once that, I mean, and the, the inventory is so incredibly low, the inventory is going to have to start. All of us, they need to realize, oh my God, look at the, look what we can get for that property. Once that inventory amount goes up, you're going to start to see that going down. And it's so flip-flopped. It's going to take a while. It's going to take quite a while. And, they, and the cost of material is going to have to go down at the same time. So but I cannot what... imagine we can maintain this because but it's going to be quite a while. That's, that's good for the, the person selling, but banks going to take the hit on this sometime. It just can't keep going. I think the state's going to cause a problem with that at the rate they're going. Right now, one of the pieces of legislation they're talking about is imposing more uh, taxes on on sold real estate, real estate so that it can be used for affordable housing in southern Maine. 
Yep. So they, they, they've got a lot of those weird bills going, trying to push in right now. So I'll probably slow it down a little. Yeah. Yep. Well, that another one they put through today that it's probably going to go through is to uh, authorize local use tax for restaurants and lodging. So the cities can start having their own uh, sales tax on them. Hmm. All businesses closing. All right. Well, if nobody else has anything, we'll cut Rob free so he can call his realtor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. Any, if anybody has a question, they can email me. They can call me um, anytime. That's perfectly fine. If you don't have my contact information, Anthony certainly has it. He can get that to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Rob. Have a good night. Too. All right. So as, <laughs> far, like to... as far as the tabling of those items on the camp counselor and that till next one, I I see Lily's not here, so she was probably already anticipating that for next time. So why don't we just leave that one tabled if that's yeah. okay with everyone? All right. So Sorry. next up we have a discussion on how to conduct future select board meetings. We had done some, I did a walkthrough of the town office there a couple of months ago, trying to figure out if we had to go to some sort of a hybrid model, how we might be able to do that. And I think Anthony and your thing, we've incorporated some of the things that we talked about trying to trying to figure that out if we're allowed to do that moving forward because I, I feel like oh sorry actually I'll take a motion to open that item <laughs> for so be it. moved and seconded all those in favor all right one two three four five so we can continue to meet by zoom so we have the time frame in July where the state is looking to go back to quote unquote normal. And are, are we gonna be allowed to continue with a hybrid model? Does any, do we have any sort of an answer for that? Oh, I think Melanie as long, so, and Dan, please weigh in here because you may have some inside information that I do not, but I think as long as you are meeting in person and then you, and then in addition to that, you offer some sort of a uh, online option. I think that is going to be allowed regardless of whether or not the state agrees to allow remote meetings moving forward. Dan, would that, would that be your read of the situation? Well, you, you, it, when we were meeting in person, you can always broadcast it anyway or, or do it online. So that's, that's what's always legal. Uh, we haven't seen the bill come before the full legislature yet uh, from judiciary, so uh, I'm not sure if they're going to allow continued Zoom meetings or not. I know we had one come before us today on banking that asked to allow uh, board of directors for banks and credit unions to to uh, vote online, and I think that got tabled because it's it's kind of a 50-50 split between the legislators. So um, I don't know what will happen with that one. So Yeah. So, Dan, is there... Oh, I'm sorry, Melanie. So I was going to say, because I think we've always been able to broadcast the meetings. We didn't do so because, well, first we hadn't done it. And then when we looked into doing it, the, the option to do it at a free or low cost to the town was no longer on the table. But being able to broadcast it and allowing folks who aren't at the in-person meeting to be participatory, two very different things. So that's what I want. I mean, I don't want for someone who's joining us from home to not be allowed to participate if they're not, say, at the town office in person for the meeting. So that's the part, the legal piece that if we choose to do that, that we've got to make sure that it isn't just the folks who are there in person that are allowed to participate, because that would also limit if a, if a select board member wanted to participate from home. Well, I, again, I, until I actually see the legislation, I mean, 
it may if, if they say we have to meet in person then probably the select board member wouldn't be able to participate from home you'd have to have the board meeting in a room and then people weighing in through uh zoom or whatever if we had a zoom thing open and they chatted in or whatever i mean there's nothing that says you can't take questions from from people if, if they had a telephone they could you know you could have them on the line they could call in a question i don't think there's anything that says you can't do that so i'm not real sh real sure until i actually see what they decided to come up with yeah because i guess i'm just thinking of like when i've watched the augusta city council nobody who's outside of there is calling in or participating they're not Right. So, and that, that may have been something they just board. set up as a board. Um, yeah, just like we're supposed to vote. To, if somebody doesn't live in your town, you're supposed to vote to allow them to speak at town meeting. You know, it's it's kind of the same thing. It's just a matter of what the town sets up. But uh, they really need to look at this. I mean, if you look at the numbers that the people who've been participating in this, I mean, it's way more than we get it in that office because people don't want to go out after they get home at night and i i like this i think it's great yeah i agree we did we did our first um library book group today in a hybrid format there were six of us actually in the library and we had a laptop that was set up so that we could see the two people who were not able to be there one was in massachusetts and one was in new jersey um but um, you know, it, it worked, it worked out fine. So, you know, I, I don't know, um, you know, we'll have to wait and see how the legalities turn out. But I mean, I think that to continue with a hybrid model would be great. Yeah. Oh, go Anthony, ahead, Dan. Anthony, uh, has MMA sent you anything? I know they send out the bulletins and stuff, and I just haven't seen it, uh, saying, to, uh, sending it out to the town, selling the town to watch for this LD number. So um, I don't know been, what the LD number is. So yeah, so it was uh, it was LD thirty two, thirty two, and uh, and they've been sending out some daily missives, Dan, uh, but I have not seen this one uh, in any of okay. the. the I'll, I'll try to look it up tomorrow. Okay, but but you know I think um, you know Rick raises a good point. Of course, the MMA has been supportive of continuing to allow some sort of remote participation. And I just got to believe the state's going to find some way in order to, to make that happen simply because it is a way to uh, enfranchise a whole lot of people who, as Rick said previously, wouldn't trudge down to the town office on a Tuesday night. Yeah, and, and I, I suspect they're going to come up with something. I don't think they're just going to shut it off. Yeah, and, and so in the memo, you know, I, I offered two different ways that we could achieve, I think, uh, this hybrid model. And one is simply to have a set of laptops in front of each of you guys and in front of the town manager, uh, you know, tuned to Zoom uh, so that uh, people could, uh, you know, log on to Zoom and watch uh, your discussions. Uh, but we would also need to have a, uh, a laptop, I think, on a podium in the meeting room. And so if someone wanted to speak to the board, they would actually have to approach the podium so that our online audience could hear what that person was saying as well. And so yeah. we recently uh, acquired some, some laptops for training purposes. They were only about $250 a piece. And so we would need to acquire five more of those in order to, um, uh, to equip everyone with a, with a laptop. And so that's a cost of, of $1,250. And we still have more, nearly $4,000 in unspent funds for, for computer replacement that's, that was budgeted for this year. The other option is this new device called a meeting owl. And I would encourage you guys to Google that and go online and, and check it out for yourself. But it's uh, it looks like a kind of like a, a water bottle, and, but it's got a rotating top with uh, two uh, cameras on it. It looks like owl eyes and it rotates and finds wherever the, the, the speech is coming from you, you interface that with, uh, your, with Zoom. And so I sent out a, a message to the main town and city managers association listserv, just seeing if any other communities have been using this. And I got a, a fair number of responses back and all of them were positive. Uh, the only 
uh, drawback to this is, you know, you have to be within a certain distance of the device for it to really clearly uh, pick up someone's voice. And I think our meeting room is small enough that that would not be um, much of an issue. And so that's a device that costs about a thousand dollars. So we do have some we do have some options uh, open to us that uh, that we could look at if we're looking at moving to a hybrid model. Mm -hmm. With the, with the uh, multiple laptop model, um, would we have to be concerned about audio feedback? Because that was the problem that we had with the library book group this morning that um, Megan still had her phone on because she her audio on because she's letting people in. So we Dan's shaking his head yes. So we just, you know, just yeah. have to be very that's, rigorous about that's, that's only one person that. talking at a time. <laughs> yeah. So, I, have to use, so, I have to use that when we're at the legislature. We're all sitting in our uh, committee room because if you if you don't have that on, you have feedback every time somebody's talking. Yeah, I like the owl idea. Yeah, I do too. Seems to be a cheaper and you know a more effective way to reach everybody that's speaking. See them. And and, and so with the owl, all the participants wouldn't have to have laptops, but it would be broadcast through Zoom to people outside? Is that what you're saying? Right. So it's an, it's an either or. Either we have individual laptops or we do the owl. You know, As and- Possibilities. Yeah. So, so I guess I'm, let me just pose a question here. So if, would the owl be used for audience participation? Because if we're going to do a, any sort of a Zoom hybrid, each of the board members still has to have a laptop so that they're visible through the whole meeting. Whereas if this owl is only picking up who's speaking, you're going to miss a good chunk of the meeting in the recording. And you are correct, Melanie, on that. So we would still, so we'd still be looking at that piece. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, legislation, the proposed legislation right now. Let's see what it says. It says if a body determines the public, public may attend a meeting by remote means, all members of the public must be able to hear and see, hear, see, and hear. I don't know how they got that bill printed wrong. Hear, see, and hear, hear all members of the body. So they have to be able to see us at all times and hear us if we speak. Um, typically, it doesn't talk about the public whether you have to see them, but I know when we're doing committee stuff, you're supposed to be on camera. They'll tell you to turn your camera on. Um, is Dan, is that to verify that whoever is being identified on Zoom is... Probably they, they are probably because when we do meetings and we have the testimony, they, they ask you first thing they do is ask you to introduce yourself and tell them where you're from. Because, um, you know, with these meetings, if we go public, you know, you could have somebody from California you know, weighing in on, on, on something that. So if we if we start doing these and, and, and do these hybrids, we're going to have to get a lot stricter on on how we run the meetings, too. Yeah, the, the bill, the, right now the bill's very vague. So I'll see if I can do some research. I'll find out what's going on with it tomorrow. So we might not have to change anything at all. Is that you might, we might not, don't know. Until this actually comes before the legislature. And again, this is the original bill as printed that this doesn't tell me if the judiciary amended it or anything either. I won't get that until they hand us out the paper agenda. Okay. I kind of like the laptop idea. I feel like that keeps keeps it to one person speaking at a time at the podium. Um, if if every board member would have to have a laptop at their spot as well as the town manager. Um, we're all already going to have laptops in front of us, so it would make sense if if there was one at the podium, and the 
The only the only hesitation I have with that is if we have someone with limited mobility, if they're able to get to the podium. Well, at at the podium, you probably wouldn't necessarily need a laptop, as long as you had a camera. It would be just a camera that's hooked to a laptop. You know, if whoever the secretary is, or if Mary's there, or somebody, you know, has has a is on there, they have a camera hooked to it, just like a normal camera on a computer. As long as it's got a speaker, uh, the microphone in it, you know, that way it would project it onto our laptops and everybody else's that's listening. Because we'd, we'd already see them standing there, obviously, if we were in the room. Right. So it was more for them to be participatory in the Zoom aspect of it. So. Anybody else want to weigh in? All right, well. Seems like we have some time to figure it out. About a month. <laughs> when do we? When do we have to figure it out? But well, either uh, once the once the governor's current executive, or once the governor's executive order expires, we have thirty days after that to go back to doing business the way we were previously, unless the legislature adopt some legislation that uh, that approves some new rules. And okay. so right now, right now, the, the current executive order is set to expire on June the 12th. And I have not heard anything. And Dan, perhaps you have as to whether or not the governor intends to extend that. I, I haven't, but I almost suspect she'll extend it. I, I would be surprised if she didn't. So, so for the so is what I'm hearing is for the time being we'll continue meeting via Zoom, and we're going to sort of stay in this state in this holding pattern until we know what the what the new rules, if any, are. Yeah. And in the meantime, I would continue to price out what it's going to cost and see what you're going to do for. I mean, they don't have to be full size laptops either. You know. Oh no. Yeah. So, so yeah. these are are more like tablets, Dan. They're they're right. They're small in nature, and that's why. One of the reasons why they're only two hundred and fifty dollars, you know, which is a yeah, a all you need something something basic. I mean, they they bought tablets that we had to use at the civic center for all the legislature to be able to vote. So I mean, you, can, you can just get a small tablet style thing. It'll be good. So um, what that, happened to the ones that we bought? Plus, what happened to the laptops that we bought that um, we just bought them not many years ago? I am, I'm using one of them, Ricky. Yeah. I mean, I, I had one. I turned it back in. So they got to be around someplace. Yeah, we have, we have some of them. Some of them have been given to, like, planning board members and so forth to use for Zoom meetings uh, and such. But uh, um, but I don't know how, I don't know how, how, how well your work, yours works, Melanie. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear good reports on some of the other ones. Well, and I just, when I went to put it up, I got a big flash saying, if this is unplugged at all, it's dead. And so it said, it has a very unhealthy battery. <laughs> I was like, no kidding, you don't say. That's, that's like the one I'm using right now from the state, because I wasn't going out and buying another a laptop. I don't have laptops. And uh, they gave me one from the state and it has to be plugged in. Both If I unplug it within two minutes, it's, it's dead. Yeah, this is like two seconds. <laughs> and then when you plug it back in, it says, hold on, we have 35 updates. <laughs> Great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, so moving on. Uh, well, when do we want to bring this back? Our next meeting is next week. Or do we want to reconsider this, the first one in July, when maybe we have an idea of what's coming? Well, I, th I think... Yeah. Go ahead, Dan. No, I was just say I, I would say you know just do the research and then bring it back to the board first of July and see what happens. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll continue to follow the news and if the news warrants a, another discussion next week, then then we'll discuss it again next week. In the meantime, I may send send you guys just a link to the meeting owl just so you can sort of see that device yourself. The the, the other thing we may be able to check into too is we might be able to use some of that COVID money. For the laptops good idea yeah there may be a 
a, 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 what you can, there's different things you can use it for and it may allow, this may be allowing it for the remote meetings. Yeah. And if we have that money in for the computer replacement, we had a plan for, it was over a couple of years where we were gonna replace this block and then this block. So I don't wanna tap into that if we've yet to replace the computers that we were supposed to be replacing with that. Well, and we're, and we're working with, uh, with Maine Tech and they feel like we're in good shape right now. So we replaced a couple of computers this year, but not as many as, as we thought that we might have to. Okay. All right, so next up we have the discussion and consideration of an RFP for snow plowing, sanding, and ice control. I'll take a motion to open that item. So moved. Moved and seconded. Those in favor? All right, that item is... Anthony, do you want to lead that one? Well, yeah, I mean, this is... Um pretty much the same RFP that we've used in the past for plowing services. Uh, we did get some feedback, uh, and which is good feedback, that we should replace some of the references on pages three and four of the RFP so that we're not you know, saying that, that we're plowing up to someone's home or someone's property to actually put an address uh, to that because obviously property owners change and you know, a new vendor may not know a particular name on a property. So, um, so that's a change. And I think we have, let's see, one, two, three, four. We have six of those on pages three and four. So we'd like to just go ahead and switch out the addresses uh, for those. But, uh, but otherwise, we'd like to uh, do what we do with RFPs with, with like this. Uh, we'll send them to the vendors that we know in this area. We'll post them on the website and on the Maine Municipal Association website and collect um, responses for two weeks and then bring it back to you at the end of July. Yes, I got a question. Are we taking out that salt priority route that we've had started? And, yeah. And again, uh, well, and again, this is, um, this is what we've used in the past. And I thought that that, that might be raised as a question. So that's up to the board. If you guys want us to remove that section, that's something we can very easily do. Well, I mean, my feeling is how can we keep doing that if we've got well problems now? I mean, we're just asking for trouble in other places. Um, I just think it needs to go away. I've said that from day one. Just out of curiosity, too, at some point, we ought to, so we have a number that we know it would cost the town. We also ought to find out from some of these vendors what they're charged to plow the other parts that the state's talking about if we want that building that they're going to have us plow a couple roads. <laughs> so we ought to kind of figure that out, too, so we probably, it's a good thing to ask while we're talking about it. So what, that's a good idea, Dan. What we could do is we could uh, have as an alternate bid uh, plowing from uh, Route 27 from, say, the Oakland Road to the Manchester Road, and then plowing Routes 8 and 11 from Cemetery Road to the Augusta Road. And just include those as alternate bids just to see what the pricing would be. Yeah. Oh, nothing's ever easy. <laughs> yeah. I just, I'd like to know what it would cost us, you know, that way when we finish up that negotiations, if, if the town decides they want that building. No, what it would, it would cost us. Right. So what are we, what are our thoughts on the salt priority? I don't understand what the issue is. So as the newbie, so could somebody just give me a little background on the salt priority? Well, if you, if you look on page five, there is one of the 10 wheeler trucks will use straight salt on its plowing loop. Right. 
priority loop consists of the following roads, Bartlett Knowles location, Old Route 27, Route 135, Penny Road and the Wings Mill Road. Right. So, and and why, the, those, why those roads? Uh, that, was a test, that was a test pilot to see how it was going to work. Those are roads that a lot of them were not heavy traveled roads. And then there's some that were heavy travel roads. And that's kind of why they did that loop, just to Got see. It. And not only that, they were, we were trying to get away from putting so much sand on the road so you didn't have to go back and scrape it all up every spring, do the shoulders and everything else. Uh -huh, but okay. uh, by adding by, by going to salt now we're back into dumping more salt on the road and the mixed salt and sand by the way where are we keeping the straight salt that they're using in the sand and salt building they just got a separate pile off to the side yes sir hmm. now has anyone i know that was supposed to be a test program has anybody like the road committee have they compiled data on that or that says yes this has been a good idea I mean, one of the things was the phosphorus runoff which was the concern with using too much sand on the roads and that we are a late community and so then you know when we did have the contractors had to upfit their vehicles with with something with a capacity to spray this solution. So if somebody bids who is not so equipped, we don't have a provision in here that would assist them in upfitting their vehicles, correct? Which I believe we had done initially because we were requesting that this be a new program. So Melanie, I can say we do not have any data. In fact, until Rick just said that, I wasn't even aware that there was a that the, that was a test project to see how well it, it would it would work. So Rick was the last time that this was put out to bid that was added in there at that time. Been, I think it's been in there a couple times. Okay, it has yeah. been because it's. What, seems what, like it's when, when I was first on, when I was on the board the last time we had started that, yeah. I'd been, been off for quite a while. I think it was six years or something like that. But I think it's at least six, because I remember when we first were talking about it, I had to do the state had gone to that on the interstate, the spraying down of the solution before a storm so that there was less snow that was adhering to the road surface. But I don't think that's the part that I'm real concerned about. I think I'm more concerned about the rock salt that they're putting on the road. Um, that's what's causing the problem with the wells, whether they want to believe it or not. Um, it's not all Belgrade's fault here. But I, I'm going to tell you, I think you're going to have a hard job getting that water, whatever it is, system through. If, if Belgrade's still putting salt on the roads. I mean, that's just from mud in a frying pan, as far as I'm concerned. Um, if Belgrade's going to keep doing that, I'm going to tell you right now, I'll probably vote against it. Why, well, why wouldn't we just nix it from the from the bidding? I mean, could, couldn't we just do that? Cancel the, the salt loop altogether and just, just have sand and salt go back to it? I mean, seems like the wise thing to do, considering what, uh, you know, the salt contamination issues we have granted it you know around that area there was a lot more salt going into the ground because it was a big pile that was leaching into the ground there over over time but still you know as, as rick says you know it's a it's a problem and you know at, at anybody along any of these roads that, that gets a you know some salt uh, they, they could test their well they could have a salt you know high salt uh, content and and come to the town and say well you put salt here that's why you know and, and then they're going to want a well or a water system or new appliances or whatever the heck it is you know and i don't know it seems like if it's been a, a a pilot project and there hasn't really been any conclusive results from it um then maybe we should just go back to the way it was you know at this point 
and maybe not have the salt prior because that was one of the negotiations with DOT and that was one of the first questions I asked was if if we were going to enter into an agreement with DOT, then one of the things that needed to be made part of that agreement was that that triangle was no longer salt priority um, because we're simply adding, rubbing salt into the wound for. <laughs> so now the reality is, is, is that we can't, you know, can we insist that DOT takes that off salt priority, but then we're still picking our own spots for salt priority? Probably not. So is everyone in agreement that we change that section to eliminate the, the section about salt priority? Seems to make I'd, sense. I'd make that motion. We eliminate that section. Are we still pre-treating? Are we still putting the liquid on, on the roads and stuff? Yeah, and you can drink this stuff because I've asked the state many times. I said, well, I'll go get you a glass. Oh, yeah. We heard that right from the get-go. And I'd asked for what the long-term results were with the vegetation and that. And Look at the trees. I mean, I they take a rocket scientist. Well, I, I just don't remember seeing any recently any pre-treating being done. Are we, are, are we still doing it? They do it when they're sanding. They run right, right on the truck to run when they're sanding. Okay, so we're, we're buying the, the chemical? It says it's, uh, it, it's supplied by the town. Right, but I don't, remember, I don't remember us supplying it for a while, so that's what I'm asking. It's up to the state garage. They get it right out of the state then. Okay. All right. Because I don't think, I mean, I'm with Dan, and, and granted, I'm gone a lot during the day, but I don't remember seeing any of our trucks putting the pre-treating solution down that is supposed to raise the surface temperature. They're supposed to be doing it when they're sanding, but with the sand. Same time. You probably wouldn't see it. It doesn't come out like spray like okay. a truck when it goes by. The mist that's specified in the bid so to have that kind of system that sprays as you say so where so where are we okay. standing i just i just was wondering if we were doing that so i mean i okay uh, are we going to nix the salt loop so there's a motion on the floor to take the salt loop out was there a second i think yeah. so okay moved and seconded all right, is there any more discussion? All right, seeing none. Ricky? Yes. Ernie? Yes. Dan? Yes. Barbara? Yes. All right, five yeses. Let's get rid of our salt loop. And other than that, is there anything else in there that folks want clarification on? All right, then seeing none. Just and just so I'm clear, so we will add per Dan's idea, just alternate bids for uh, plowing the portions of 27 and 8 and 11 that are part of the triangle, correct? And just as an alternate bid. Well, it, it, was, it was the roads that the state wanted us to take over, which was yeah, well, well out of and 27 and, all the way to yeah. yeah. Route 27 from the intersection of 225. Got well, I think Sydney line. Well, they, they said they'd actually come in towards Belgrade almost as far as somewhere around Hammond or down by the post office somewhere. But we'd have to go the rest of the way to Rome. Right, because wasn't it North Augusta is where they can pick up from? So they would go from North Augusta, but they wanted. Yeah, they were going to do that part of that little end. But I think, but and, and, am I mistaken? Were they not talking about paying us to plow those roads? No, it was, I think it was an exchange for us ending up with that building. Okay, well then it, yeah. So then it would be the length of um, 27, eight and 11, and I guess 135. 135 is a state aid road. 
uh, yeah, and I'm not sure. You'd have to. You'd have to probably ask them. On okay, that. I'll ask. I'll ask that. But but, but remember uh, they remember when they were talking to us? They were talking about uh, that they've been trying to find a contractor or somebody yes. to take over those roads for years. And yes, this, this may be a way for them to get away from having to plow it if they gave us the building and we could take over doing the plowing. I think I'd want to have that. I'd want to have that building gift, you know, somehow noted, you know. Oh yeah. For, yeah well, that, it would have to be actually go through the legislature for, for them to yeah. transfer the thing anyway. So then you want to do your math on that and see if that's going to be worth it. That's and, and that's what I wanted to know what it was going to cost. Yeah. And, and to find out and to find, and, and actually we are probably ought to go back and talk to them and find out, you know, if it was plowing it for that price for ever or, or, or if they were going to subsidize part of it or, you know. Okay. So, so I'll contact Jamie Andrews about that, but, but, uh, but we will just include... get like a map out of what the, how many miles it would be and maybe an addendum that says, you know, the town is currently in negotiations with DOT and this number, this amount of mileage may be added to the plowing contract. So what, additional cost would there be to the town to add this on if if so be because otherwise if this happens and we say we agree to a three-year contract and a year and a half in dot is like we're not plowing you guys you said this is what we're giving you and then we don't have anyone to take that over well and that that would be a danger because uh, um when last I spoke with the Warren brothers, they said that they were willing to bid on another contract, three-year contract, and then after that, they would have to reevaluate. And so there's no guarantee that we will have a, a, a reliable plow contractor four years from now. Right. So one of the reasons I think it's a good idea to find out is because you gotta remember that these trucks have to drive over these roads anyway. Right. So they're, they're traveling over anyway. So what's it going to cost if they're plowing while they're driving? Yeah. And we we already do plow 135, right? Yes. Route 8 and yes. 11 the Manchester line. So. Yes. And, and then the state uh, reimburses us part of the cost of that, Barbara. Yeah. It's, it's what is known as a state aid road. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that would continue because when we were talking that day, he was only talking about the roads that they physically plow. So that's why I said you might want to con contact him and just tell him we're talking about it. Where are the roads? What are the boundaries? And what's the deal they're looking for so that we, we know. Okay. And do okay. we want to see that again before we put it out for RFP? Uh, probably we could wait until next week i would think yeah I'll, I'll have it to you i'll have it to you at the at the next meeting okay perfect all right looks like we're at the warrant anthony we might if we keep moving like this we might be done before you have to pop out for a minute that'd be wonderful you might be like, bye bye now. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get going. So, this is warrant number 61 in the amount of $573,533.41. I'll make that motion. Second. All right. All those in favor? That is open for discussion. I tried to pick it apart, but I didn't find anything this time. Well, I did. I just had a question for ticked off. What are, I mean, we've clearly moved the Memorial Day celebration, but do we know what ticked off is using? Um, Cause I did have my property evaluated and there's two ways to go. And if you go with what is mostly organic, it's it's quite a difference in cost. So I wondered if this is the one application and then you're good for four months, which is not the organic. This says, uh, yes, it says all natural insecticide granules for, for $40. 
It says twenty dollars each times two. So does it cost one hundred eighty nine? Yeah, so so that doesn't include the uh, uh, that's just the cost of the, the granules themselves, and then and then the uh, uh, it says value added starting at yard protection. So I assume that's the labor. Look into that, I guess. Okay, I'll report back to you guys. How how is that a separate company? That ticked off. Is that we the stuff we put down, or is that a company that came in and did the work? Uh, I'd have to I'd have to double check on that. It, all it's yeah, all it says is ticked off. Because so I'm just wondering if if it's another company coming in and doing the spray, and how come we're not using the same company we use in for all our other pest stuff? Well, the the other pest stuff, they're not actually spraying anything. They're just those are live traps. Yeah, but they they do. Spraying just like modern pest does. Oh well, and... yeah, perhaps they do, but I, I mean, I you know, I'd have to check with Chris. I assume I assume he used the same outfit that we've used in the past for the for the okay. tick control at the cemetery. Okay. Do we spray anything at the uh, center uh, outside? That, you know, like during summer camp or something to ward uh, off I ticks. I believe Lily told me that that she did once before. I see a Chris on here. Chris, is that is that you attending the meeting right now? Yes, it is. Oh well, jump in here, Chris. Explain it to us. So uh, the Tick Off Company is a company we've been using for the last three years since I joined. I think Gary used it before um, I got on. So it's an outfit that comes and sprays the memorial for ticks. Okay. Okay. So, is there a particular reason why we're, I guess, probably further consideration why we're only doing that area, and if we should be considering doing other areas, or if it's an expenditure that we don't need to be making at all, if we're. So I assume I assume that. The reason that we spray the cemetery at that time of year is for the Memorial Day in anticipation of the Memorial Day ceremony. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, people. Because in the past, people complain about ticks getting on them and stuff, so that's why they've been spraying. Right. I don't know. I guess I'm just kind of like you know. But if somebody's at the park, we don't care. Or playground in North Belgrade that we just put in or <laughs> right so we should either care about it everywhere or especially if we don't really know what they're putting down or I don't know it's just like I don't want modern pests just going in and spraying some crap down around you know where kids are playing <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I think we ought to take and do some price checking and just get some quotes from everybody and find out it because most most of these different pest companies will do tick spraying and mosquito spraying and everything else. So we ought to kind of find out what we could get a package deal for. Yeah, brown tail moth too. Mosquito banditos is doing. Yeah, they're doing people's high up high trees and. Yeah, yeah that's going to be a discussion, I think, in the future. Yeah, well, that that is something we'll uh, we'll explore as part of the next year's budget process. Yeah. Good plan. Um, does anybody else have anything on this warrant? All right, seeing none. Barbara. Yes. Dan. Yes. Ernie. Yes. Ricky. Yes. Five four zero against town manager report. Got one minute, Anthony. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So uh, let me. Uh, I'm texting. Yep. I'm here. Oh, okay. Mary Lou is here. I was just texting Eleanor as well. So, so as far as the vet, veterinary uh, memorial, um, Gary Mahler is going to have a report for you next week on that. There's been a, there's been a hitch in that. So he, he'll be talking to you about that next week. So Mary Lou, do you want to talk about what the food pantry would like to do at the uh, North Belgrade Center? Sure. Um, the pantry board met about a month ago and wanted to express their gratitude to the town of Belgrade. And we had seen what a great job the, the floor 
how much nicer the floor looks. And we were wondering if we could offer to spruce up the rest of the interior of the building by painting walls, um, doing a thorough cleaning in the kitchen, maybe painting the kitchen, painting the bathrooms, doing a little repair work on some of the woodwork that has got some cracks and some chips out of it. And, uh, and we also were um, wondering if you would like to accept a newer refrigerator freezer. Um, we're hoping to get a, a larger refrigerator and we have a refrigerator with the freezer on the top that I believe is better than the one that you have there. And you know, we'd be happy to give you that one if you um, wanted it. And, and we would do all of this with volunteer labor, the painting and cleaning and all that. So that's what we'd like to offer to the town. But the town would be purchasing the paint? No, no, we would pay for the paint. We would pay for everything. It would, it would be no cost to the, to the town. Yeah. Thank you. I agree. Sounds like a very nice offer. Just Anthony. don't paint it bright orange. <laughs> Can we pick the color? <laughs> Can we keep it neutral? Yes. <laughs> Anthony, do you need to pop out for a minute? Okay. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. Just pick a nice neutral color and those cards have been there for forever, though. But yeah, come on, they've got to. I don't go. think we can sell them as antiques. <laughs> come on, come on. They, they may fall apart when you take them off. down. I think when we pull them, they're just going to shred down. <laughs> but Chris, I wanted to ask you, is the um, floor in the kitchen done, or are you just waiting on that? Uh, I'm just waiting on a rainy day. OK. Are you going to do the floor in the entrance way or no? Uh, depends on what I have left. Okay. Okay. Well, we're thinking that we would probably do this in, in September sometime after the summer when we can get volunteers together and it's not so busy and it's not so hot. Um, so if, if you're in agreement, you know, then we can just kind of start talking to our volunteers about who likes to paint, who likes to do this and, and organize a weekend or two to do this. Yeah, I'll make the motion. Good. I'll, I'll second, second that motion. Moved and seconded. Any more discussion? All right, seeing none, we trust you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. One yeah. other question. Chris, I see that your refri the refrigerator is gone. <laughs> Where did the refrigerator or the pantry go? Uh, went to a residence that the refrigerator died. Oh, okay. All right. So you, you're willing to accept the one we're going to, we'll just, when we get our new one, we'll put um, the old one in there. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, we, we thought that offer was on the table, Mary Lou. So we just unloaded the stuff and brought the fridge over. <laughs> well, I walked in the other day and the free refrigerator was gone. I'm going, wait, we didn't get approval yet. I didn't know this was a done deal, but I guess it was. <laughs> well, it, it had to do with the, the salt well contaminations. One of the residents that were replacing a refrigerator, they couldn't get the refrigerator for a month. Yeah. So we had to put something in there temporarily. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that is another issue. As I, once I have this approval, I'm going to start calling around, but I might not be able to get a refrigerator either immediately. So it might be a while before I can put one in there. I, Oz may be back in another couple of weeks, hopefully. So. Oh, it wasn't a permanent thing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so we can get that one back next week if, if need yeah, be. As soon as the new one comes in that for the, for the resident. I see. Hi, Eleanor. <laughs> I think we just got approved, Eleanor. So I think we're good to go. So I'm going to trust your judgment on the colors, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Yes. All right. Yeah, we're all set. We're at the part about the dog registration incentive program. You're muted, Anthony. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. So um, in order to encourage people to register their dogs um, by the end of the year, Mary had this idea that we would have a um, sort of a drawing for a pet full of, 
a basket full of pet goodies if they register their dog by the, by the end of the year. And so to pay for the pet goodies that would be in that basket, she is proposing that we allow employees to wear jeans for a fee of $2 per day, excluding casual Fridays uh, through the end of October. And so I'm hoping you'll just allow us to go ahead and do this. I think I view it as a win-win opportunity. We will hopefully incentivize more people to register their dogs as opposed to having to track them down each fall. And it would help to uh, boost staff morale. Apparently there's a, a real sentiment that people would like to be able to wear jeans a little bit more often. They, they're gonna throw a gift certificate in there to doggy daycare or doggy grooming. <laughs> You know, actually, that would be a good idea. I know uh, Barbara and I each take our dogs to uh, Willow Run, and they love it there. Yeah. I know. Well, and I was thinking it shouldn't just be on the backs of the town employees, that if we could get donations from some of the area facilities, that that would be a good idea. Yeah. So, so there's a dress code that does not allow yeah. jeans? Is well, just, uh, I don't know that we have a, a formal, uh, well, it probably is in the employee guidelines, but our, our practice is that uh, uh, we don't wear jeans unless uh, it's Friday or unless we're, do, we're engaged in something where that would be appropriate. So we don't just typically wear, wear jeans on, you know, the, the usual weekday. Yeah, it's casual office attire, which. Okay. I, I, I don't have a problem with them doing it. Yeah, I mean, if that's what they want to do, if they're willing to do that, if that's what they want to do, go Great. for it. That's all I had for the town manager's report. Amen. Does anybody have anything else that they want to talk about before we beat feet? I just have two things concerning North Belgrade. One is we talked about um, porta potties last meeting, I think. And as I drive by the North Belgrade Community Center with the nice new playground, did we ever consider having a porta potty there? Because without a porta potty and without having access to the building, it just presumes that people are just there for, for a short time, uh, you know, as opposed to having to, you know, be there long enough or, or are, are close to home. So I'm just wondering if it would open up the use of that facility if there were a porta potty there. So I'm just putting that forward. And then the other thing about North Belgrade is um, in response to the citizen concern about people swimming at the North Belgrade boat launch, which is a problem, you know, it just got me thinking about a town that has 56.3 miles of shoreline um, and maybe what 150 or 200 feet of public access other than the boat launches. Um, you know, I know there's been thought in the past about a swimming area. There is a recommendation in the comprehensive plan to have um, a swimming area in North Belgrade. And uh, so I just wanted to kind of, you know, put that on the table to kind of think about it. Not, not now, I just want to sort of mention these couple of things about North Belgrade and maybe we can take them up at, at another time. Good thoughts for discussion, Barbara. There is a porta potty at the fire station in North Belgrade. And there's one right beside the building, close to the town. Right beside the building. I didn't. I didn't even know that, and I drive by it every day. Yeah, there's one right there on the right hand. You're looking at it on the right hand side. Yep. Yeah, maybe maybe we could post a sign up to North Belgrade uh, at the community center. Yeah. Sure. Take, uh, take your toddler across through eight to the porta potty. Good plan. <laughs> oh, right now I know porta potties are hard to come by. Because everybody's doing that home reconstruction. Because <laughs> building costs are down. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, I don't know what it is, but I remember just seeing a news thing not a week or so ago. About companies that are there back ordered for a month or two on porta potties. Oh. You're looking for a motion to adjourn this? Yes. I so be it. Second that. All those in favor. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>